Добър вечер, добър вечер. Um, I'm going to speak in English and um, this lecture will be in English. So if you need, um, uh, I don't know, translation, you can get the, um, yeah, there. Um, so I just want to say my name is Nijana Krasteva. I'm one of the curators of the show together with Katarina Lazarova, but she's a bit unwell today, so she couldn't uh, participate. Uh, so how many of you have seen the show? Most, 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 very well done, very well done. Um, yeah, so I um, have to say that, um, you know, a show about ecology uh, is always um, a bit weird to talk about because then you have, uh, you have been asking questions about, but, 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 but why uh, the show has not been done ecologically? Why are you inviting all these people and flying them and, you know, increasing the carbon footprint? And um, so, but uh, we actually approached a critical art ensemble at the very start of the show. And we asked them, could you please, please, because we thought this is the problem with the uh, shows about ecology is that they are actually not made ecologically. And, uh, you know, all the shows and art industry is actually highly unecological endeavor. Uh, so we asked them, so how can we do <laughs> shows more ecological? Can you give us a set of instructions? And uh, Steve was... Um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, why don't you make works locally? Uh, why don't you not ship artists <laughs> by plane? Or if they do, they, you will not invite them to the opening. And um, we, uh, if I get you right, uh, so we couldn't do that 100%, but we did a lot. We made a lot of works uh, locally. Uh, we reduced to absolute minimum the shipping when we really needed to in terms of, or we, we really thought like, should we ship original works on cop or just make copies? But we thought there is something about the encounter, you know, something about looking something in the eyes or looking at an artwork that is not a copy, is not a Xerox, is not, that makes it special. Uh, so... We still voted for actually bringing artists in uh, so you can meet them, you can talk to them, you can ask them questions, and you can hear what they say. So I have the greatest, greatest, greatest honor to <laughs> invite um, Steve. And he has been here in Moscow in 2016. Yeah, he gave a lecture here. Uh, so let's see what the difference is <laughs> in time, please. Thank you so much. Oh, there it is, 30 years. Um, it's really nice to be here tonight and to come back to Moscow. It's a city I always enjoy. Um, it's always kind of full of adventures and surprises. And, and maybe we can, if we're lucky, we can have a couple of people here tonight. So it's, it's weird. I usually don't do these big overview lectures because our work, it's spanned a long time. And it has covered many different topics. Um, the environmental struggle has been somewhat recently. We've been working at that the past 10 years or so. But I'm going to take you back through a number of ways of how we thought about subjects such as tacticality and public space and other issues that we have found to be of great concern to us and that have kind of continued onward. They don't seem to fade away. They seem to always continue as part of the work. Now, I'm starting here in a really strange place because this was certainly not a spectacular project by any means. But it's an interesting way, I think, to kind of set a foundation for what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, this was a project, as you can see, done in Havana, Cuba. It was a workshop. And for doing work like ours, which has a very explicit political dimension and a very explicit sociological dimension, Havana is a very, very tough place to work, right? When we got off the plane, the authorities were waiting for us. 
right? And we didn't help ourselves because we did it at the Hannah Arendt Institute, which is Tanya Bergera's institute. And she's in the middle of an incredible game of hardball with the Cuban government, uh, which she's already gone to jail for and served six months. So this was a, <laughs> this was a, a, a different kind of project, but at this workshop, what made it really different was the workshop opened with what we could be charged with if we do the workshop and how much time in jail we would have to serve. And it depends how we did it. If we did it without digital equipment, it would have been five years. If we do it with digital equipment, it would be 15 years. We know the authorities are watching us. So how do we get away? How do we build some kind of plausible deniability where we can at least say something. And I've got to say that the people who attended this, I mean, these were some courageous folks. Normally when people come to a critical art ensemble workshop, going to jail is not what they're thinking about. True. Um, but in this case, yeah, that's, that's kind of what it took because there is a real crackdown, again, on any kind of arts that has an ideological perspective that in any way deviates from the Cuban government's dominant version of how people should think and how people should create. So what came of it at the end, and as I said, nothing spectacular. We made stickers and t-shirts that said, we can trust each other. All right? And as you know, when you're in situations like that, that's the worst part. That's what's really fermented among the population, is how do we get everyone to not trust one another, to always think that at any minute, this person could turn on me, they could turn me into the government for some crime, they could file a complaint. And so for them, this was an amazing statement. This was like a blow against the empire. It was hard for me to understand. It was something I had to kind of wrap my brain around and slowly come to. But this is what we're going to be talking about tonight, is what is this disciplinary apparatus that's everywhere? It's not just Cuba, you might feel it more there, but it's everywhere. And how do we function within it as artists? How do we function within it as trying to think about a different way of conceiving the world and organizing socially and politically? So, so we're gonna go way back for a minute. And this again, this is another, this is kind of the bookend to the Cuba workshop. This is a, a, a sub-project of a much larger project that we were doing in, a, in Winnebago. We were driving around to various places where people who like caravans and campers would hang out and, and we would do different art actions at them, see what kind of attention we could get. But I just wanna pull this one project out, are we there yet? to talk about how we started to conceive of public space very early on in, in our career. And how we had, to, we figured out very quickly how we had to think about it if we were going to put any kind of minoritarian thought into people's heads. So you can see what we, what we did, and we had no money at this point, right? We're, we're just out of grad school and stuff, we're, we're broke. So we have to figure out with the simplest of gestures, how do we illustrate what it is we're thinking in regard to discipline and to public space? And this is what we came up with. Our performance artist here is putting together a Hot Wheels track. There are these little cars and a plastic track this has got his army soldiers, and um, on the boom box, there's a montage tape of basically car crashes and little kids saying, are we there yet? He's off to the side. This is at Daytona Beach, which, you know, is supposed to be one of the autonomous zones, right? We've got people getting drunk and taking drugs and jumping off cranes and going swimming and racing up and down the beach, right? But the minute we do this, that is, have an adult play with toys in public space. Look who's there, almost instantly. He hasn't even finished setting up yet. And already, we've got cops there. And those two cops are discussing what should we arrest him for. He's just playing with toys. 
but no, no. The first they're thinking it's a, it's a deranged Vietnam vet. Hate to debt myself like that, but yeah, it was a long time ago. Um, but they start discussing what crime should we charge him with? In public, In public right? So they're thinking like, and, and this is the thing, in the US, and this is true again in almost any country I've ever been to, there is a sliding scale of just arbitrary crimes people can be charged with. And in this case, they are saying, well, we could pick him up for vagrancies. We could pick him up for blocking public access. That's always a very popular one. And as you'll see as we go along, the, um, as we, I'll show you some other projects, there's some way more difficult charges that they can choose that are serious felonies that you can go to jail for for a long time. And they're, like I said, they're completely arbitrary. Um, as they are pulling out the handcuffs, he stops, and that was that. But you can see how interesting this is. And what the people saw, and this was the interesting part, is as the police were about to arrest him, people started booing. They were like, hey. And then all of a sudden, what seemed like this autonomous zone, this place of freedom where we can do what we want here at Daytona Beach, becomes the exact opposite that the disciplinary apparatus that underlies it shows itself. And when they saw that, it was like a shock to the system. And it was a shock to us, too. We didn't know this was going to work as well as it did. And it worked everywhere we did it. Now, um, in the US, we've sacked the deck a little bit, because there are so many cops in the US. It's almost off the charts. It's, you know, they're a population unto themselves. Right? You know, you have to remember our prison system has as many inmates as the entire population of Finland. All right. Here's another one. Like I said, this is backing up. We have no money. We're just trying to figure out how do we do these simple gestures. And <clears throat> this is going to be, you know, horribly detailed US centric. I, I apologize to begin with, but Hopefully, there's a greater lesson that will flow internationally. Um, <clears throat> early days of Photoshop, as you can tell. What was happening is... Photoshop, Photoshop started, but... <laughs> no. <laughs> this is really early. I mean, you had early Photoshop in the 80s. <laughs> Photoshop 1.0. <laughs> I'm promising you that we made that with Photoshop. <laughs> and uh, what, was, what was happening was this is after the NEA5 and the Andre Serrano fiasco, and censorship as an issue is in the air. It was never an issue for us. We think it's a kind of stupid issue, because wherever you go, built into the way political and social organization works, baked right in, is expression management. Right? Censorship's going on all the time. And, and the internalization of censorship, in which we self-censor ourselves. There's never a time that that train is not running. It's always there. It's, it's just, it, when, usually when censorship is brought up, it means that somehow the norms of censorship have been violated in some way, however those norms are interpreted. OK, so this politician, Geraldine Ferraro, who also ran for vice president one time, was going to run for Senate against conservative Al D'Amato. And since in New York, which was both their hometowns, there was this censorship discourse going on, if we can call it that, she was going to have a night of free expression and invited artists from different New York galleries to contribute work, and at the end of the show, it would be auctioned off, and those auctions would go to her campaign fund. So we made this, and we got asked to do it. And uh, it's pretty self-explanatory, I think. You know, this was a time of great generic centrism in the United States. It was hard to tell the parties apart. <laughs> we gave this to them. It was at Metro Pictures, it was really fun. We gave them this piece, and of course it was immediately censored. She throws it right out of the show. The conservative paper, the New York Post, gets a hold of it. Headlines on page six, Jerry censors art 
at night of free expression turns into this wonderful scandal for us. We got exactly what we wanted out of it. And at the end, she kind of had to back down and put it in, into the show after all, and it sold for zero at auction. So, you know, sometimes it works for you like that. Not always. We have lots of projects that go wrong. I don't mean to say they're all successful, although we're going to look at successful ones tonight. But, you know, we screw them up like anyone else does, too. <clears throat> all right. Oh, God. OK, so we're going to hop ahead a little bit. Now we're, we're starting to get some budgets. So we can do slightly larger projects. And at this particular point, this is something we were totally wrong about. But it's, it's still an interesting discussion. And that is, what would 20th and 21st century, late 20th century, early 21st century eugenics look like? Because what was happening in Europe and in most of the Western world in North America was that reproductive assistance was becoming more and more popular. And as that was happening, that meant there was starting to become more and more choice and rationalization of the reproductive process. And that meant that we were going to have different kind of designer babies. And you know, now, after the revolution in molecular biology, you would think it had gotten a lot worse, though I'm, I'm not sure that it has. Right? The place where we were wrong is we thought this was going to really accelerate. Right, that the markets would normatize this behavior. And if you weren't going to a reproductive assisted clinic for pregnancy, you know, you're going to kind of get left in the genetic dust, as it were. That's, it's, it's been actually pretty stable, this kind of plateau of, of, of people using these services, because it never normalized. You know, it's, it's never been a good thing when you say, well, I'm going to reproductive services tomorrow. Isn't that great? No, most people don't seem to go along with that idea. So, but at the time, we thought, you know, let's try and talk about it. And where we opened was in Vienna. And when we get to Vienna, this is the headline. That's in the cultural section of the newspapers. This is not, this is not the way you want to start. To start with, <laughs> let's kill a baby. And so in a Catholic country, like Austria, people were enraged. And so we had protesters outside the exhibition. Um, it, was, it was an interesting one. It's the only time the religious disciplinary apparatus has ever come for us. But they did. OK, so what were we doing? We weren't, there, it wasn't really kind of <laughs> anything to do with killing babies. Um, OK, so when you came in to the exhibition site, you started in a, a room full of computers in which you could take a donor viability test. And we used a real one. I should probably have put some images of that in, because that's hilarious in itself, the underlying ideology that, <laughs> that produces these things. And you'd go through, it was a long test. It, takes, it took quite a while to do, you know, like half an hour. You had to really put some time into it. And at the end of it, when you put in your orders, we had written a script that would kind of grade your test. And you would get either a certificate of genetic merit or you would get rejected. Now, here's where we found a really interesting moment in the power of performance. Because even though everyone knew this was an artwork, this was performative, though it intersected the real, there was very much fictional about it. People wanted to know why they got rejected. It was like a personal insult when they got the rejected. And almost everybody got that. It was hard to pass, just as if you went to one of these clinics and looked through their donors. They really are incredibly carefully screened, uh, although not by their test isn't graded by computer. It's graded by doctors in consultation with one another. But I think we did a pretty good job of simulating what the decisions would be. So people are going, why was I rejected? We would usually explain it to them. And most of the time, it was because they were taking drugs. It was like, you don't get to be a donor if you have a history of drug use. You know, boom, you're right out. Uh, <laughs> it's just the way it is. So people are you know, getting stopped in the exhibition. They can't 
continue on. Most people don't like it, but it starts to get them to the idea of how differentiation within the genetic market is going to work. So for some, we would, if you made it further, we would flash freeze some of your cells and keep those on for our records. We would take blood and do DNA extraction from that. We did that directly. And you can see, I mean, talk about some old molecular science. Here's at the very beginning. Look at that. Look at this thermocycler. It's, it was like the size of a barrel. You know, now they're like this big. You know, you use microtubes now. But back then, uh, for people to see this kind of science, it wasn't really readily available. It wasn't what most people saw, when, the, especially going to an art show, and how that functioned, and how it worked, and what the political ramification of it would be. So like I said, we're, we're, we're able to start looking into a kind of issue that, other than theoretically, like we could write a book about it. And there is, we did a book called Flesh Machine, too, that accompanied this. But, we, we could start looking into things that back when we were broke artists, we could, we could never have thought of, right? You know, we're back in the old days thinking of, okay, what's the single gesture that will show the nature of public space? And speaking of public space, all right, this was done in Australia. And it was, it, it, it's one of those things that show some projects can just happen accidentally and work out OK. And this is one where I was out in a parking lot smoking, back when I still could smoke. And um, there was an Aboriginal guy there that I started talking to. And they had rediscovered their language. And in it, they had rediscovered what different places had traditionally been called. And they had started a campaign to rename Victoria Square its aboriginal name, Tardinyunga, or to at least dual name it, which seemed fair. And this was a pretty popular policy in Australia by this time. By 2002, most everything was getting dual named, but they were really getting sandbagged by the city council. You know, um, <laughs> they, for, for whatever reason, I guess because it's, you know, named after the greatest imperialist the world has ever seen, you know, that it, it couldn't ever really be touched. And so I said, well, you know, we can find out where the city makes their signs and just go change the names ourselves. You know, there's no reason that we have to go through all this city council process when we can just get some signs. And, OK, so here, here's where, you know, this is what separates the good curators from the OK curators, is when we told the person who is curating um, the, art, the Adelaide Art Festival of this plan, she went, OK, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to get you a speaking engagement, a keynote, at the festival, and I'm going to pay you a bunch of money but then you have to finance this with that money. I went, you are on. That is a deal. I only wish more curators would make such a deal with me. That's how it should be. So that's what we did. She, I did that lecture. She gave me the check. I cashed it. And we went and got a bunch of signs. All right, so how do we do this? Now, clearly, we're doing something patently illegal. You're not supposed to be taking down public signs and putting up your own signs. Um, but we figured if we'd maybe just do this in plain sight, we might get away with it. So we waited for there to be a big concert in the park, which there were lots of because it was the art festival. Waited for one of the big, it was a huge hip hop festival. And <laughs> we just walked through the square and changed the signs. <laughs> and yeah. Oh, there's, yeah, they're singing, there's cops on horses, yeah. So we just went in and said, okay, we're going to, and everyone took it like, you know, we knew, we had the orange vests on, so clearly, you know, we have the authority to do what we're doing. <laughs> and a lot of it is, it's like getting, getting your camouflage right. <laughs> 
So while we were doing that, a newspaper reporter notices what we're doing and says, what are you doing? And we said, oh, we're just doing some work for the city. He was like, no, you're not. You're not with the city. <laughs> and then, all right, so we're busted. Um, I said, OK, here, look, here's our, a contact. Give me yours, and we will send you a statement tomorrow about what we're doing. And basically, we just said, uh, you know, we're dual naming this place, and we're going to continue to do this for as long as it takes until the city council officially dual names it. About six weeks later, and I'm in no way saying it was because of us, but about six weeks later, they dual named the square. So, so you know, I mean, it did, it did enough to bring some kind of public pressure. It did something, I, but I can't, and this is the thing with, with so many of these projects, it's impossible to measure the impact. You just, you never really know. You just have to kind of go with the fact that if lots of people are doing them, um, perhaps in aggregate, it will make some kind of causal impact in some way. So that's how we think about that. All right, moving along. <laughs> Here's a public space project that we really got in trouble for, and we were not trying to do anything provocative. We were really, we, we, we were just there to try and have some fun. That's where, so we're in Canada and uh, at the Nova Scotia School of Art doing a workshop. And we started asking the workshop attendees, what do you think would be a good project for us to do? And since we're in Nova Scotia and much of the economy is based on tourism, they were like, well, we should address the tourists in some way. And we are like, well, you're not going to do like we hate tourists, are we? Locals only, that kind of thing. And you're like, no, no, no. What, what we think we really need to talk about are all the various public secrets and stupid things that Nova Scotia has done that a tourist might not even necessarily see. Let's bring those into visibility. Let's, let's, let's show some of those and tell some of those public secrets. I thought, okay, that sounds like a good idea. Sounds like it'll be fun, it'll be kind of comic, and we shouldn't really in, be insulting anyone because, you know, you can take a joke. And then they also said, you know, one thing Canadians do a lot. This is them, and they're Canadians. It's not us. <laughs> I don't mean to impugn any stereotypes here. But they said, well, one thing Canadians tend to do is apologize a lot. So what, should we, what, should, what do you think we should be apologizing for that, that the tourists see? So this was one. We, we put a big sorry on this guy. He uh, was the founder of the city, but he's also... <laughs> He's also known for um, instituting the, the Nova Scotian scalping policy of Native Americans. So, so he, but no one would know that unless you kind of looked in the history. The people in the city, they all know it. But it remains a secret, so, you know, we apologized. So we, had, we got all different kinds of things that we could say sorry with. For different environments, required different media. We had our sorry bricks. We had our sorry flags. We had our... Sorry, digital tags. So all different things. And out we went. Um, this one, we may have gone a little too far. This was a, <laughs> a monument to Africview, which at the time, in the mid-60s, was one of the largest African-American Canadian uh, towns in, in Canada. And the city council of Nova Scotia was looking south to the US, and they were noticing a lot of race riots and a lot of cities burning. And that got them very worried about too many black people being in one place at one time. And so their solution was to eminent domain the land and then to disperse them, make them all go live in different cities. Only in the 60s did you get away with that. Um, so yeah, that got four sorries, <laughs> and we cemented those in. OK, but now for some more amusing things. Um, the penis kiosks. Um, if anything would make you believe in Freud's theory of sublimation, that has got to do it. So that got a sorry. Can anyone even tell what this is? Anyone have a guess? I know, it's impossible. It's the worst piece of public art ever made is what it is. 
It's supposed to be a wave to commemorate <laughs> Halifax's maritime history. And if it wasn't for the fact kids could climb on it, I don't know if it would have any use at all. So that got us sorry, just one. But it got us sorry. And, and then we had like the digital tags that you know, we could write up to 50 lines and it could scroll the apology. And, oh, and, and there's our little pamphlet that we put in the tourist bureau so people could come and take our tour. Anyway, we have the digital tags, and mostly we are using them where you would expect them to blend in well. You can see by the scale of the hand, they're tiny. And so we put them in places like ATMs, places, ticket dispensaries, right? Automatic ticket dispensaries, places like that where you expect to see screens. But we also put it on a ferry. And the reason we put it on a ferry was it said, we apologize for the raw sewage being dumped into the bay, which it was, because no one wants the, the sewage treatment plant in their neighborhood, so they just could never build it. It was like a political impasse, and the solution was, all right, raw sewage into the sea. And we had that there. And from what we understand from newspaper accounts, some person on the boat, some worker on the boat found it, removed it. We just, it was just held on with double stick tape. We weren't trying to vandalize anything. And uh, took it to their boss. And their boss looked at it and said, well, can't be too careful these days. We'll contact the police. Now, as I'm sure everyone in this room knows, if you want to make a bad situation worse, call the police. <laughs> so the police come and they go, it's a bomb. Oh, oh it gets worse. <laughs> Not only do they think it's a bomb, they declare Halifax under attack and close the harbor and bridges. <laughs> right? So, I mean, there's thousands of dollars worth of freight that's supposed to be coming in. It can't go in. It's Friday at 5 o'clock. No one can get home because you can't use the bridges. Right? So <laughs> the, the, the next day, I, we didn't know any of this was going on because we finished the project. We went out to the beach. <laughs> you know, we had no idea. We're just drinking beer and stuff. The next day, I say to one of the participants, hey, let's, why don't you go and check the newspapers? You know, maybe in the culture section, <laughs> someone may have noticed something. He comes back. I think they noticed. <laughs> Yeah, we had to leave Canada pretty quick. Um, <laughs> and I was like, oh boy, <laughs> this isn't good. <laughs> so yeah, a, a different thing of public space, how, the, how these things happen. Now, <laughs> it continues to get worse because <laughs> the participant that put on, they put in the paper, police are looking for whoever stuck this box on the ferry and was gonna charge him with criminal mischief another one of these arbitrary crimes. And uh, in Canada, criminal mischief carries a pretty severe jail sentence. So everybody's a little worried right now. And we just said, look, if no one talks, we'll, pro we'll probably get away with this and no one's gonna have to get arrested. Now, we had one thing working for us is that a month or so prior to this project of ours. There had been one of these international economic meetings, I'm not sure which it was, whether it was G7 or whatever. It was one of those things. And people had come in and for protest, as you would expect, and not very many, like 300 people were there to protest. Again, the city council freaks out and imports riot police from all over Canada. So there's hundreds of riot police. And unfortunately, they had been given a new toy, and that was tear gas guns. Now, where this was staged was, if you know, if you know Halifax, it's kind of built on a hillside down into the harbor, and the stadium is up on the top of the hillside. 
So the cops start shooting all of this tear gas at the few protesters that are there who are perfectly peaceful. <laughs> and someone should have taught them basic physics about gravity. Because when you have a gas that's heavier than air and you're on a hill, it's going to go down the hill and gas all the tourists that are on the harbor front. So they were in a little bit of hot water to begin with. And uh, so, so luckily, no one really got in any trouble. You know, it kind of neutralized out after you know, a, a great fanfare of disciplinary talk. <laughs> OK, but now here's where stuff Here's where we were doing serious provocations. We are. Is, um, <laughs> we were really worried about what Monsanto was doing in Canada and were attempting to do in, in the US. And, and what they were doing is they would go to where they had a client who was using their top product, Roundup Ready Seeds, whether you know it was corn or soy or whatever. They would go there and then test the adjoining properties, particularly if they were organic or traditional farmers. Now, it's hard to keep pollen from staying in its own field. And pollen from the Roundup would go and usually infect, I'm going to call it infect, other crops. And then Monsanto would sue these farmers for patent infringement unless they would pay the licensing fee and start using Monsanto products. So we thought this was a little bit unfair and that something probably needed to be done about it to try and talk to this problem. <clears throat> and what we came up with was how could we make a kit for organic and traditional farmers that they could use the wind, much like the pollen, they were using the wind and pollen, that they could use the wind to kill Roundup Ready crops and thereby protest and, and fight back. Now, we're not really scientists, but we do know how to do research. And what we found was that when Monsanto crops got patented, they had to turn over everything they had learned about their product to the public. So we just started to look through their experiments on what screws this up. And what we found was that pyridoxal 5-phosphate, which is a harmless vitamin B um, spinoff, when mixed with Monsanto Roundup Ready herbicide and sunlight, would probably kill the plants. And so we went, the Corcoran asked us to do a project, and it was like, this is the perfect moment to do it, right? Here's what museums can really be good for sometimes, is they have a tremendous amount of legitimation. And so you can do things there that if you did other places, you might be arrested. Keep that in mind, because we're going to come back to that. You can do things there that you could get, get in some serious hot water for. And you know, we told all the local newspapers what we were doing. So in the Washington Post, it's like, artists at the Corcoran, you know, <laughs> figuring out how to kill Roundup Ready products. And of course, Monsanto wasn't going to take that lying down. And the next thing we know, that the gallery is full of lawyers, of Monsanto lawyers taking pictures, waving cease and desist notices. And I'm happy to say that, you know, the museum backed us up. They were like, look, this is the show we're doing. You know, you don't have any right to tell us not to do this. And Monsanto, <laughs> always in hot water for numerous reasons, because it does so much evil, corrupt stuff. They, they backed off the project. Now, <laughs> the downside is, is I think they turned us into the FBI, and we got on the FBI's radar. It was, a good, it was a good project. The FBI part, maybe not so good. But we think. We don't know that for sure. But that is our suspicion, as you'll see as, as we go along. So we did that provocation. And like I said, we had the cover of the Corcoran. So there wasn't much they could do without it turning into a PR mess. 
I mean, the other exhibition that was at the same time was Jackie Kennedy's ball gowns. <laughs> that was our companion <laughs> exhibition. <laughs> so, I mean, there's not much you can do against that. You're shutting down Jackie Kennedy, really? <laughs> so we got away with it. We did, we did the full project and, you know, the students at the Corcoran School helped us. They did a great job minding the plants and we did this public experiment. And it really got us going with the idea of, oh, public experiments. We could do this. Change some minds about things. So the next one we did was... Uh, here in Europe, we did it in Holland and Austria and Germany. And what we wanted to find out, was, was it possible to have the purity laws in regard to GMO foods? Right? And our suspicion was that when you're talking about such mass import of things like soy and corn, and particularly once you get into processing for processed food, we didn't see any possible way that you could keep the food supply pure, that it really wasn't. And <clears throat> this was a great topic to bring people in, because normally when you start talking about molecular biological stuff and people are in an art show, they go, no, no, that's not what I came here for. You know, it's, it's, just, it's just not that interesting. Um, but when you start talking about the food that they eat and that they recognize, all of a sudden something that may not be so interesting becomes very interesting, right? Because they can see themselves in the center of what you're trying to talk about. <laughs> and from there, we could get to our real issue of what we were truly worried about. And that is, what is it going to look like when a few food industries control the food supply? And we've already seen what happens, you know, great examples in India where, I mean, they just decimated certain farming communities. Argentina, we might look at this if we have time, look at that later. Again, you know, the favelas are overflowing. Why? Because the GMO people kicked all the peasants off the land and said, sorry, you're not farming anymore. Uh, we're taking over. So that's what we wanted to get to. And this was a way to start with, uh, you know, your cornflakes and Doritos, and um, they might be contaminated because I don't know how you can control it. Well, this is totally impressionistic, but the results were, if you're in Holland, we did not find any contamination. They might have figured a way. Maybe it's a small enough country they can do it. Germany, 50-50. Half the products we tested were totally contaminated, and half of them weren't. And then my favorite, Austria, you know, who food is like this national culture that, that they go mental over the purity of their food, right? We got to Austria, every single thing we tested was contaminated. So yeah, another slight scandal that we weren't welcome back in Austria for a really long time. <laughs> okay, so we, we, got that, we got that project done. It was another great way of discussion to lead into you know, to, to build cascades of knowledge in people, right? To start folks where they're comfortable and move them into other areas of consideration that then directly relate to their individual concerns and desires. But then, ouch. So, the FBI, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, Joint Terrorism Task Force, Homeland Security, raided my house and arrested me for bioterrorism. That was really a bad day. <laughs> uh, and it took four years of my life and a quarter million dollars to get out of it. I'm still very thankful to all the artists that contributed work and stuff to help me raise money to, to fight this particular charge, which in the end wasn't even bioterrorism. They charged me for it with uh, mail and wire fraud, saying that I had fraudulently gotten a hold of some bacteria that we were using for the project I'll show you next. So, you know, like I said, sometimes the arrest gets deferred. Maybe they didn't get us at the Corcoran, but uh, it, it just waited a few years and, uh, and then finally uh, caught up with it. And <clears throat> it's also, we were doing these anti-germ warfare projects at the time, which I'm sure they were not happy about that either. 
So here's, here's one of them, to kind of give you an idea of what we were doing. So we were, we were recreating experiments that were done in the 50s of dispersal patterns for germ devices made for war. You can see that maybe how that could get someone in trouble. But we weren't using anything dangerous. We were using simulants. We were using the exact simulants that the Army used, but it's not something that could make anyone sick or that could destroy anything. Or, but it would give you a really good idea of what the dispersal pattern was, most of which is terrible. I mean, germ warfare, the reason it, it really finally imploded was they realized it was just an uncontrollable technology. And you just you didn't know what it was going to do. And in warfare, that's a really bad thing. So you know, uh, Nixon and, 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 and right here in Russia got to, got to look uh, like looked pretty good of saying, like, we're going to stop the germ warfare programs, and got some capital for that, some political capital, even though they knew these programs were completely useless. But they scared the public. So, you know, there's a lot of spectacle you can make out of that. So we had our, our human guinea pig brigade, which was an actual thing, right? In the US, they had <laughs> these, these poor Mormons and uh, what are they called? Seventh-day Adventists. These, you know, they were like, you know, we're not fighting. We don't fight. We don't go in the army. But we are patriots. We love our country. If there's something you can think of we could do, we'll do it. And of course, the US Army went, all right, yeah, we got something you can do. We're going to test our germ warfare stuff on you. And, and that's what started the human guinea pig brigade and, and what started a lot of these tests that we were simulating. Now, most of this we did in the US and we did in England, where all the testing originally happened. But for some reason, the Germans wanted us to do one. And it's like, well, we can't do a historical one because this never happened in Germany, right? When it, when it should have happened, Hitler was in power. And as we all know, Hitler was a germaphobe. He did not like germs. He was a rocket guy. And so, you know, he quite explicitly said, we are not doing germ warfare, two different occasions. So none of this really occurred in Germany. And then after the war, they sure weren't getting the germ warfare program then. So that was all done. So what we did instead was we recreated one of the San Francisco tests. And, and how we engage, well, you have to have a band. If you're going to, if you're going to march, if the guinea pig's going to march, you got to have a band. So we did. And the way we tied this in was to uh, bring it to the American consulate, is we would surround the American consulate, and we would shoot the bacteria at the, and, and see what kind of pattern we got. So our human guinea pigs, they surrounded the consulate and you know, waited for nature to take its course, so to speak. Now, here's a very interesting moment in, in this project that goes back to the earlier bits I was talking about. Um, this was the launch zone, and those of you who have been to Leipzig know that that's City Hall. That's the great turret of City Hall. And that's where we launched the bacteria out of. Okay, now here's the interesting part about that. Is as we were driving by it while we were setting up the logistics of this project, I was looking at that tower and I was going, man, it's perfect. The wind is blowing the right way. It's pretty much a straight beeline to the American consulate from there. It's like... We've got to do it. Now, in my American mind, and also remember, I'm, I'm on probation fighting this case at this point. In my American mind, I'm thinking, we cannot go in the city hall and go, here's the deal. We need to use your tower. We, we, it's on Saturday. I know you're closed. You can just give us the keys. We'll let ourselves in. It's going to be a bunch of guys. We're going to have some equipment and stuff. You might see some smoke coming off the tower. Ignore that. And uh, we'll let ourselves out when we're done. Now, if you did that in the US, you're getting arrested. I mean, it's going to be so fast, you're not going to know what hit you. And so I wasn't even going to say we should go in. I was kind of a little intimidated by this thought, but I did. I, it blurted out. 
And the curator goes, oh, yeah, well, let's stop and ask him. I was like, oh, God. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I was like, all right. And so in we walk, unannounced, no appointment, nothing. He just says, I want to see the manager of the tower. Manager of the tower comes out. And he tells her, <laughs> he tells her what we're going to do. And she goes, OK. <laughs> OK, now, what happened there? I almost censored my own project. This is what I'm saying about the internalization of censorship, right? I almost I did, just did it to myself. And you know, thank God I blurted that out because in that different context, it's actually okay to use public buildings in a public way. Doesn't happen much, but it, it can happen. Um, I guess if you have the right legitimacy. I mean, I certainly wouldn't just walk in off the street without a curator and a festival and all that kind of thing backing you up. But it's, to me, it was still a miracle. And to me, it was a real learning experience of always blurt it out. You know, even if you think it's impossible or there's going to be serious trouble. Because you never know. So after, you know, we did the spraying, we marched them back into the main square. We took samples off everybody to see. And just like all the tests we did, they were all failures. You know, it's like no wonder this program had to and needed to end. And why we were doing this, the Bush administration, that never met a weapon it didn't like, was reviving the germ warfare program. So it was why we were doing it to try and go like, you've got to turn this down. Right, so here's, it gets even better. Is <laughs> the Institute for Microbiology, we called them up and said, hey, can you check these plates for Bacillus subtilis, which is a common germ, you know, it's, you know, it's probably on your shoes, it's probably on us right now. Uh, happily, we have skin, protects us from it. <clears throat> and uh, they went, yeah, sure. I mean, would you take bacteria samples from that guy? <laughs> I don't know if I would, but I just walked right up, here you go. And she's smiling away, going, I'll get this right back to you. As I said, the, the results were negative. All right, here, here's a kinder intervention we like. Now, a problem that seems to be happening in so many places is that cities are growing, they're becoming more expensive, and as that happens, community spaces, public spaces, free spaces, autonomous zones, <clears throat> however you want to describe them, are disappearing, right? Developers are getting them, throwing the people off that developed that land and saying, sorry, we're taking over. We got to build some condos here. So we thought, all right, what can we do about this? And we came up with a tactic, but it's a, a tactic that's rough to do. Um, the stars really have to be aligned for this, but it can happen. So we're in turn. And we thought, OK, here's the idea, is we will get endangered species plants. And we'll plant those all over these places that seem to be threatened by overdevelopment. And in this way, we can get some type of legal document, depending on where you are, what kind of document you get, that can act as an injunction against building, because you can't bulldoze the endangered species plants. Well, we didn't know how much trouble we were in terms of method. This turned into a nightmare. Because you know, we thought, like, we'll just find an endangered species that's been domesticated, get the seeds, grow it, plant it. We're out of here. You know, it's going to be like a two-week project. 14 months later, because <laughs> um, you know, the farmer who taught us how to grow the stuff said, look, you can't just put it in a pot and then go plant it out in the yard, because it's not going to live, right? You've really got to give it a kind of wild existence in terms of the planting if you're going to put it in the wild and expect it to be able to compete and to be able to live. So it's going to take a year for you to just grow the plant to get it ready to be able to be planted in these spaces you're interested in. It's like, Dear. So this is what had to line up, is you have to have the law that protects the endangered species. You have to have domestic, domesticated seeds 
of an endangered species. Right? And then you have to have the time and knowledge to do it, you know, the place to do it. So this guy was really nice in giving us a spot to grow this little mini crop that, that we were growing. And then it, at the end, we got to plant it. Now, <laughs> the other thing we learned here, and this, this won't be surprised to anyone who is environmentally minded in terms of endangered species, is that um, the developers have way, way more money and way, way more lawyers. And the endangered species has nothing, right? So they're going to sue, and eventually they're going to win. And that's pretty much what has happened every time. We've never really been able to save a space. We've been able to put it off. And this is the fate of so much environmental activism, right? They find a legal way to put it off for a bit. But eventually, you know, we just seem to lose every time. And this, and this was no exception. You know, we got to put it off a little bit. And then at the end, the other cool thing you get to do at the end is you get to do video of them bulldozing endangered species and then put that out. They, they, they hate that. That's like the worst PR ever. It looks so bad when you see a bulldozer running over a field of flowers of Cupid's dart. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I don't, this is one of those ones that's hard to even declare. Was, is it, was this an excess, a successful tactic or not? I mean, that's when everyone's going to have to think through themselves. All right, for a little bit, we got into doing monuments. Now we're starting to get really big budgets. <laughs> People are giving us money. <clears throat> and so we wanted to do something on understanding the numbers when we talk about the 1% and the 99%. What does this really mean? Because it's, I mean, can you, do you know that, what's the difference between 100 million and a billion? I mean, it's quantitatively more, but do we understand it in any kind of qualitative way? And I would suggest probably not, because humans, we've evolved over the years somewhere around 300, 350. After that, it's, it's just a weird abstraction, right? That it becomes very difficult to, to, in some way, manifest physically or to think of it in material terms, to think of it in an embodied way. So we thought, OK, well, how are we going to do this? And um, first thing we did was we made a, worked with a statistician from NYU to make a proportional chart of wealth separation in terms of global classes. So what we did is we cut it into 20% quintiles. So you can see 80% of the people of the world are pretty close to one. This is 20 meters high. So 80% are in there. Um, the bottom one, the bottom 20%, and for lots of young people in the audience today, this will interest you, um, that should be at absolute zero, right? That's the folks that live off a dollar or two dollars a day, right? And, you know, they don't have any credit. They can't go in the hole. They're just kind of subsisting at this dollar a day. So it always was this absolute zero. But because of student debt, <laughs> this is now a negative. What they thought was an absolute has actually moved into the hole. Pretty unbelievable. All right, and then you know we have our rich, you know, 80 to 99 percenters. They, you know, there's there's a pretty big difference. Those folks are pretty comfortable, right? But then we have our true economic elite. And if we were going to do that, to put that one percent in, that banner would have to be 225 meters high, basically kind of the size of a skyscraper. And, you know, this was documented. There's nothing at Castle that high. So we used a helicopter instead to take people up. And, you know, you can really get an embodied feeling of what, what that proportional difference is when you're looking down on all the ants, right? So we could give it some kind of real physicality, a phenomenology, an embodiment to what this statistic really means. So that was one level. But then there was the second level of the project. And we got, you know, for using the language of the festival, we got absolutely crucified. And we did it on VIP day. Now, because, I mean, it, 
if you've ever been around helicopters, they are really loud. I mean, they are bloody loud. And we're right by the orangerie, so we ruined the VIP's Sunday in the park because the helicopter is just blasting the whole time and it's about inequality. And they are just beside themselves that we would do such a thing. And they came, the, the way they mainly came at us was in an environmental attack. And they, you know, and they said, how dare you use a helicopter? I mean, what, how, can't you think about the environment at all? And our response was, <laughs> You're at a destination festival. You just decamped the entire art world and moved it to middle of nowhere, Germany. And you're, <laughs> you just moved all of this work. I mean, there was one woman who moved an entire scrapyard from Italy to Germany, because that's how she liked to put her pieces, her sculptures, into that scrapyard. It's like, I don't even know what kind of, that was perfectly fine, apparently. You know, <laughs> no worries there. And, you can really think of this as a return to your first year theory class when you learned what commodity fetish was. Because um, uh, how do you think all the sculptures get into that garden? They walk there? No, they're helicoptered in. <laughs> it's, like, it's like helicopters are part of this festival, but, but not just that. The reason that we can do this the reason that there's the fuel and energy to do this, the reason that we can sit around and contemplate art all day long is because some people have these helicopters overhead all the time, and the helicopters aren't friendly. They're not moving art in those places. Right? So that was the big debate we got into over that one. So again, it's something you can think through yourself, whether or not to... Uh, <laughs> make a daily exception of rules, which normally we wouldn't. Normally we would, we would avoid using a helicopter. But since it was such a fundamental part of the language of this festival and what's going on there, we found it kind of irresistible. And if you wanted to go on a helicopter, there are two ways. You could go the 99% way. That cost a coin, any denomination from any currency. Or you could go this way, 200 euro, and you got a nice handmade, even a paper, you know, letterpress invitation that you could use for a pass that you had a reserve seat to get on the helicopter. And they all sold. You know, that, now, were many used? No. But this is, I mean, again, this just shows the nature of it, right? There's kind of the students that go see document on their student visa. And then there's the wealthy people, the VIP people, that. 200 euro, come on, man, that's a bottle of wine. So, you know, you may as well have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. You know, like two completely different ideologies of how, how you attend and the way you attend an exhibition. So we tried to get into some of that, too. So monumentalism. We were trying to work out, just as a digression here, we were trying to work out as well, how do you do a monument that's not completely offensive, right? We've got to figure this out. Because what we do know is once we get to certain levels of, ac of excess in society, once the division of labor reaches a certain complexity, we start building monuments. I don't know why that is, but it happens. And it seems if there is a cultural universal, that might be it. Is that we just can't get away from the things. So how would you do one that doesn't fetishize and try to pretend that it's universal and eternal? And that's what you're trying to figure out with these. Like, what would a monument look like? You just have it up for a day. And then it comes down. And it doesn't bother. It deterritorializes. You never know it was there. It said its piece, and it went away. That would be better, wouldn't it, than the ones that, you know, it's like I had to look at this my entire life. I disagree with everything it stands for. And it's something good about public art in general. It's like, you know, you can do more radical stuff if you tell people it's going to go away. Right? But when someone's going, I got to look at this my whole life, it's in our community. No. OK. So this was another one where we infuriated our audiences all night long. 
last one. We're gonna, we'll open it to questions after this. Um, <laughs> so what we wanted to do is, what if it was a dialogic monument where you took two oppositional point of views and incorporated them both? So it's completely conflicted. And the way we did this, um, we were given the main square in Toronto. And they were like, do your project. I was like, oh, boy. So the main square, that's where discussions are supposed to happen, right? In the mythology of democracy, we're supposed to go into the main square and debate with one another and settle issues and persuade each other. So we thought, OK, let's, let's go ahead and play into that myth. And <laughs> we'll debate it out. So we studied, and we seriously did. We seriously tried to make as good a project as we could that took the corporate position about extraction industries. And this is the time during the pipeline, even though I'm not sure why that was such a big problem, since the pipeline network is everywhere all the time now. In North America, it's insane. <clears throat> and also the tar sands extraction. I mean, all kinds of ugly stuff, the very worst of the extraction industry. But we tried to make the best case we could. And we made the case for energy independence and why that's a better thing than going and blowing people up to take their oil to have energy independence, or at least to keep the market stabilized. So that's where we started. And we studied all you know, BP's films and Exxon's films and all their propaganda and tried to make it as best we could we had our two Can-American energy tanks with a pipeline between them to symbolize the relationship between Canada and the US. <laughs> and you know, here was our spokesperson. She was the vice president of public relations for Can-American Oil. And she's who gives the lecture on why it's so important that we fight against war and ins instead have domestic markets. She did a great job. For those of you, if there are any science fiction nerds out there, you might recognize her as the Wraith from Babylon 5. <laughs> that was her, her other, she was awesome at, at doing this vice president thing, though. All right, so we make that argument, but then we start the counter argument. And our pipe explodes. <laughs> yeah. We worked with a PR company for a long time, or a um, special effects company, to get this kind of goop and dye. So that, you know, the water starts turning, it looked beautiful too, starts turning black and the goop is, is coming up everywhere. And it's like, you know, and for us, this is the counter argument. <laughs> and it is, I mean, that's what everyone always points to. It's the best, it's the best argument you make. This is what you're gonna get sooner or later. And you know, then we had some taggers come in and draw skulls on the, people love that part. Now you have to remember, there, well that was, the, it was later at night. Because in the, in the early part, when we were doing the corporate side, the extraction side, people furious. We're never going to Nui Blanche again. This is taxpayer money being wasted. I mean, absolutely beside themselves. Less now, because we're later in the night and it's mainly drunk people and they, you know, they're all about, let's see a catastrophe. You know, let's see our fountain get totally destroyed by a break in a pipeline. And then we finally closed it down. The fire department came out and put up the danger tape and chased everyone out of the park, said you can't stay here anymore. It's a toxic zone. So there was the two counter, you know, of making that kind of conflicted monument, a different way of, of putting things together, a different way of using public space in the mythic way you know, how we, we always at least dream it could work. So, you know, like I said, this kind of gives you an overview of tacticality, of monumentality, of public space, right? These issues that stayed with us, and of course the disciplinary apparatus, which as you can see, we've met in spades over the course of our, <laughs> our existence. Right? And that, you know, maybe now we can start talking about what are the tactics we need now? And especially with the exhibition that is up right now, right? It shows us a lot. It really paints quite a picture. But we still do have to organize what are we going to do about it. And we also know, this is one of the things that kind of authoritarian countries have known for quite a while, at least a century, that culture really matters in this. 
that culture is going to really be the thing that makes the case. And the more the way we understand human nature, especially through behavioral economics, and we realize we're really not that rational. We are not homo economicus, right? In fact, we're probably the very opposite. We're pretty non-rational beings. And who's going to speak to that? It's not going to be scientists, really. It's not going to be the economists. It's going to be you guys. It's going to be the culturalists. And together, if we can do it, like I said, build that aggregate of work, maybe we can change the tide a little bit so the direction that this exhibition paints might not have to go that way. So I want to thank you all for coming tonight. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Stay as long as you want. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, thank you um, for this lecture. Uh, what's your motivation of this doing? Uh, maybe you can tell in two words. Uh, motivations. I, yeah. <laughs> that, you know, that's a, that's, a, that's a tough one to discuss, given you know, the remarks that I ended with. That, that takes a lot of self-awareness to understand what our, <laughs> what our motivations really are. But if I'm going to say it from the rational side, it's because we, you know, we think that there are some principles worth fighting for, that there are some principles I'd rather see in the world, and there are others I really wish would go away, that they disturb me. And this is the non-rational part, is they disturb me in a profound emotional way, and also in terms of both the inflation and deflation of desire. Right? So that, that's what has kept me going. Now, I could, I could also say I could be like, you know, a psychoanalysis here and say, well, back when I was a teen, my parents sent me to bloody boys' school, and after getting beaten on a regular basis by various authoritarians that pretended to be teachers there, I had enough motivation to make anti-authoritarianism a career. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that might, that might be part of it, too. A few good beatings. Um, but no, it's, it's, I, I don't know what it is. I, there's a, a kind of empathy that I have for, for, for those that seem to be in such bad condition that there's almost no way for them to defend. You know, how, do, how do we create solidarity with that so I can make that bad feeling go away? Uh, yeah, thank you. It's a uh, more emotional part, just keeping you, yeah? I think so. I mean, ultimately, that's what I think. I mean, I, you know, I can recite you chapter and verse of theoretical reasons for doing it. But, you know, when you put it in that psychological frame of motivation, I, <laughs> it's not because I've been persuaded by some theoretical argument. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so which of these public actions, or maybe exhibitions, or maybe, I don't know, what? what? Uh, so which is your favorite, and why? Oh. And which is unfavorite, of course? <laughs> well, I didn't show you any of the unfavorites. <laughs> but I'll tell you about one, if you would like. Would you like to hear about an unfavorite? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> OK. Well, I, I have this lecture. I, it's not requested very much, but it's a, it's a good one, and it's called Crash and Burn. <laughs> and it's about projects that went horribly wrong. Um, so let me give you an example. We did a project one time in South Florida in this place called Indian Town. And the folks who lived there were Guatemalan agricultural workers. And there was a hope that the, agricultural, the National Agricultural Union could make some inroads with the Guatemalans. It was really difficult. It really wasn't, it really wasn't happening. And the reason it wasn't happening is because all those Guatemalans who were mainly Mayan knew if they got sent back to Guatemala, that was a death sentence. So they were very scared. They weren't cooperating with anyone. Politics was like, no, man, I'm just here to work and collect my money. And we thought, well, maybe we can go in and try a more cultural route rather than trying to make this persuasion through solidarity and through economy. 
So we, we think of some projects we're going to do. And uh, we go and we speak to these mediators called the Corn Maya Project, who you know, helped in negotiations between employers and employees and helped people get their green cards and such like. And they said, oh, you know, this sounds like an interesting idea. Um, and we said, well, well, what should we do? They said, well, you know, you could have Easter's coming. You could have an Easter fiesta. I mean, that's traditional. People will really like that. And we thought, that's great. We'll do that. We can weave the projects into it, do some invisible theater, you know, do some video work that can remain somewhat passive. You know, and we did it, and it was a good day, and everybody had fun, and we all feasted, and people danced, and you know, we had the local marimba band playing. It seemed like it's like, man, maybe this project's working out. And <clears throat> so later that night afterwards, we go out and go drinking with a number of the folks that are there. And as people get drunker and drunker, they start saying what's really on their mind. <laughs> and, uh, and as it turned out, um, we had, what we had accomplished uh, was two things. One, people are like, why are these white people here doing this? We, you know, they have to be working for the cops. So we sent like this giant wave of paranoia through the entire community. I mean, bad. Yeah. <laughs> I, oh, yeah. So we, we, prob we probably should have thought that one through a little bit better that, you know, they're, they're going to ask why. And then the second thing was, we, we funded it, but the people thought Corn Maya funded it. And they were like, hey, that's the money you're supposed to be helping me get a green card with. And so this really kind of good organization, we just absolutely frayed their relationship to the people they were trying to represent. I mean, we screwed it up so bad. That was one of my least favorite projects. But we learned a lot from it about, media, about not using mediating institutions, don't do that. <laughs> Number one, always go directly and always do temporary work. All right. um, that, was, that was a great learning lesson. And investigate a lot, you know, more research. <laughs> don't, ju don't just jump in. Uh, so it, you know, we, we learn from our mistakes, but God, you know, uh, you, you know, who paid for those mistakes? They did. Wasn't us. We walked away unscathed. It was totally terrible. And you know, I've got some more stories like that. But yeah, I, when you when you do these things, you, mistakes are made. And uh, you know, the best thing all you can really do is own them, and uh, try to never repeat them. Okay, a favorite project. Oh, I guess of the ones that I showed. So. You, uh, in some ways, Flesh Machine was one of my favorite projects. And the reason it was, was a meta reason. It was because it was, we finally figured out our model of collectivity, how it was going to work. So that took us like 10 years of on-the-job on learning. And we also figured out how to really do project-based work with undermining research and with accompanying theory. So it, to us, it, it was the first time we really made a holistic project that it took us 10 years to figure like, ah, uh, finally, this is what we've been working towards. Finally, you know, we've, we've hit our vision. And so for that, because it was, you know, kind of like a rebirth, it was a new start for the group and, and how we did what we did. Uh, I, you know, I always kind of have a very fond memory for that project. Thanks a lot. Sure. Hi. Uh, it's been a really good lecture, and all the time I was thinking at how much brave you need to have to be such a provocative. And uh, I'm sure after each of your projects, you've been ha having a big wave of feedbacks. And my question is, have you ever been afraid of criticism or hating or something like this? Yeah, man, I'm afraid all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding me? Yeah, no, I'm afraid. I'm it, it, that comes with it is you have to kind of live with the fear and sometimes the terror. Because, you know, like when that FBI raid happened, that was really a bad day. <laughs> and I have to say, I was quite scared. I thought I might be going to jail for a long time. And, and one thing 
that I, that I have to say is please, nobody ever go to jail for art, <laughs> right? There's principles that I would go to jail for, but in artwork, no way. The goal of artwork is to do something interesting and not go to jail, right? But the thing with the, the courage question and that you have to remember is that if once you go out in the public space, and I hope you know that you got this in, in the lecture tonight, once you go out in public space and you do something that is in any way out of the norm, if you express something that is not supposed to be expressed as part of the norm of that space, you're risking problems. There's gonna be pushback, and you're gonna meet some people you're not gonna like, right? So it, it kind of comes with the nature of, be, of being a public artist. It's, it's, you know, and I try to explain this to my students, and they, and they go, well, what about free speech? It's like, there's no freaking free speech. Some myth written on a piece of paper it doesn't really exist. You know, and, and they're shocked that you know, when they go out and say something, all of a sudden there's police. It's like, well, if you're going to go out and act weird, police are coming. Yeah. So it's, it's just a, a kind of constant state. It's, you know, it's, and believe me, it's not because I'm any more courageous than the next person. And how do you think it is easier to make such a project in Russia or, or harder? <laughs> um, <laughs> if, <laughs> no, I, I, I this, <laughs> some of these projects I, I wouldn't do, but you have to remember it depends. Let me give you an example. All right, the, the first time I was in Beijing, right, mm -hmm. and we're doing a project, and I'm looking around, you know, and I, I'm in the central circle, and it's like, man, I mean, anybody gets out of line, it's trouble and really fast. But, but we realized as we got to the outer rings, once we were in circle five, it was friggin' anarchy out there. I mean, complete anarchy. We could do anything, right? So a lot of it is, is finding the spot, you know? And, and don't, you can't like categorically say, Russia's gonna be a tough place to do some interventionist projects. Well, yeah, it might be, but there might be plenty of places, if you research it out, that it wouldn't be, you know? So it's, there's a kind of sensitivity that you have to get with with each culture that you go to, and knowing that the intensities of rules and rule enforcement and discipline, they're, they're going to vary. They're going to vary from culture to culture, but they're also going to vary within different aspects of that culture. And your job is to find where it's most in your favor. Right? So I don't really have a hierarchy of like, this country, oh no, and, <laughs> and this country, it's a breeze, because uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't exist like that. Oh, yeah. You know, you can get in serious trouble anywhere, as far as, I, and, and you can do really marvelous things anywhere. Thank you. Sure. That was interesting. Who's going? Who's next? Are oh, you next? Oh, thank you for your election. And uh, I want to ask you: you using public spaces for your actions, and uh, have you used uh, an internet? It's a great public space. Well, it was <laughs> maybe in the '90s. It was a great public space, and we did use it a lot back then. But we use it a lot less now. Uh, I, I don't know what it is. Uh, I, I feel like more and more one of the issues that has concerned us is embodiment. And the internet is doing so much separation, right, and, and, and so much reduction in who people are that I tend to stay away from it now. And, and also, too, you know, all of the promises in the 90s where it kind of was the Wild West a little bit where there, there were a lot of things you could do back then, particularly for actions. And we were doing a lot of electronic civil disobedient actions. But you can't do that now. 
you're going to jail. They, you know, it, neoliberalism figures stuff out, and, and it's pretty fast at doing it. And it figured out how to privatize the internet, and it figured out how to put rules in um, that really mess up activism. Because you, you can't do it, you can't do the kind of projects we do and do it on the dark web. It does no good there, right? It does absolutely no good. And so if you do it on the internet itself, um, it, it doesn't seem to work with the issues we want to work with. And a lot of that is that you can probably see from the performances and projects we do is we're very invested in the qualitative experience of our viewers, right? There's some that aren't, right? There's, if you take someone like the Yes Men, and this isn't a criticism, it's just a different model, that they're very interested in quantity. They want as many people to see what they're doing as possible, right? We're not that way. We really want to invest in the experience with the people that are there, you know? And so if quality really means something to you, the internet's a tough place to work with. The internet is a great, um, what would we call it, supplement, you know? I mean, it, it, it can help a lot in terms of front-end organization. But eventually, the life of activism, whether it's political activism or cultural activism, to, me, to my mind, still requires embodiment. Right? Life is still a constant meeting. You got to go. You know, you got to go down to City Hall and yell at the commissioners. There's kind of no getting out of that. So the answer is, yes, we used the internet quite a bit in the 90s. But as it's been locked down more and more, and as it's become the surveillance state, you know, I try to give the internet as little data as I possibly can. Um, we've used it less and less. Thank you. Sure. Um, I have a question about the, uh, the exhibit that presented uh, now at the exhibition mm -hmm. about the environmental, uh, environmental triage. triage. Yes. yes. Uh, what uh, did you expect from that voting and what would you do with the results well, we after the exhibition? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, what we hope for is that people are going to participate. And through that participation, they are participating. Yeah, they're parti <laughs> it's going to clarify their own process about how they're going to have to make environmental choices in the future. We're not going to do anything with the data af afterwards. That's, that's not the, the point. I mean, it could look that way, because you know it's a vote and everything. Um, but what's, what's important to us is that someone looks at this situation and, and thinks through, how am I going to pick this? How am I going to build hierarchies? Which is going to have to happen in the future. How am I going to build these hierarchies? On what principles am I going to use? What is the, what is the reasonable model for me to use? And if it gets people reflecting on that, that gets in their head that they, hey, I've got some tough decisions ahead of me that, that's coming, then the project is, is doing what it's supposed to do. And then, if they can see it sociologically and say, ah, well, some people are, seem to be thinking of it this way and have picked this one. And some people seem to be thinking of it this way and have picked this body of water, right? That they can start getting to some of the sociological differences and thinking, what might that be? How do I use my imagination, at least, to try and figure through what that looks like? Well, then the work is doing what it's supposed to do, right? It's that qualitative experience, again, that we're trying to get at. There's, there's, there's no end game. The process is our end, not the final count. Thank you. Sure. Uh, have you seen the results that are today? Uh, most of the visitors are voting for Baikal. Yeah. Whether it's uh, the cleanest of the sources. Uh, do you think it is right or there is no right answer? I, yeah, I'm not that smart. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know what the right answer is. And in any of the places that we've done this, I, I don't know what the right answer is exactly. Because I'm thinking through this, too. I mean, this is as new to me as it is to anyone else of going, oh, my god, the water situation's getting so bad that now we have to, to think it through. And, and so it's really about just trying to embellish the discourse. 
right? If, if we can somehow help that. I, I haven't gotten to the conclusions on any of them. Now, the other two times we've done it, tap water has won out by, by fairly big margins that people are, think first of natural water. Well, that's okay, but the water I have to drink, uh, let's work on that first. You know, it's been very utilitarian. Uh, it's been interesting here in Russia, there's a, there's a completely different perspective. And that's fascinating to me. Thank you. Sure. Um, thank you so much for yep. your lecture. Um, I, I was wondering, a lot of these um, projects seem site specific, but it also seems like there's some that um, sort of like travel from place to place, like for example, the um, reproduction mm -hmm. one. Yeah. And I was wondering, like, kind of how, you know, when it's obviously when it was going to another country, like, there were a lot of, like, cultural um, dissonance issues that you ran into. Um, and I was wondering for, you know, showing art that, you know, was created in one place and is now, like, going to another place, like, do you ever change it to, like, adjust to the culture? Like, what are some of the cultural, like, issues you might come into? Um, or face like when you're going abroad or into different spaces? Yeah, that, that really depends on the project, yeah. you know. Um, you know, to continue like with the one here, yeah, we, we, have to, we have to do different water and localize it each time and then we have to meet with different scientists and get their analysis of it. And so it's, it's pretty easy to get those specifics as long as um, folks see it as an issue. And then it travels pretty simply if you make these adjustments. The problem is when you take it somewhere and people go, what? Right. <laughs> you know, wait, what? Do you? So we, we try to not do that. You know, we, try, we try to figure out what is something that's going to resonate within that culture. And, that, and that's one of the things you become very reliant on project managers and curators for. I mean, when they're, again, when they're working at their best, that's, that's one of the things they're doing for you. Is, is to help you make the adjustments you need to make. You know, Snake John has been great on, on doing this project. You know, we could have, we could have kind of screwed it up if it, it, wasn't, it wasn't for her helping us. <laughs> yeah, so I don't, is, does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like you just connect with the people who are, you know, from that place and, and obviously research is very, is yeah. very important. But, um, yeah, and figure out what is, what is it that you need to tweak. And, there are others that are generalized enough that, um, that they move from culture to culture pretty well. Um, and, and ones that I wouldn't expect, it's, we did this project once called um, Free Beer and Cigarettes for the Unemployed. And because, uh, you know, we, were, we just got sick, we were kind of hanging out in a homeless area. And, you know, they're asking people, they're spare changing and asking for money and such like, and people are like, I'm not giving you money, you're just gonna buy drugs and alcohol with it. And it's like, well, wouldn't you, if you're in their position, I'd want some drugs and alcohol. So we thought like, you know, there should actually be a program where you can go get some tobacco and some alcohol. And, and so we did it, we did it in England. And you know, it was, and for there it was perfect. We did it in Sheffield where there were 20% unemployment at the time. And so needless to say, we had very long lines of people wanting to get. And you know, it was just all about how do we again remake public space? And incidentally, oh, for the question of you know, how have we messed something up? You probably know how we, that one we messed up. Public drinking for women and for men, not the same. <laughs> you know, and so it, it, there was a bit of a gender issue in, in, that, particular, in that particular project. But here's the weird thing. I don't know, it's five years later or so, we get a call from the National Museum in Tokyo, in, um, of uh, Kyoto, and they're like, we want you to do free alcohol and tobacco for the unemployed. I was, I was stunned. You know, I, can't, I was like, that's the project you want. They're like, yes. <laughs> I don't know, and like I said, I'm not really sure what they were seeing in it. I tried to extract it, but I, I don't know. I don't know why they, <laughs> yes, we went and did it. They, it was packed. I mean, people were coming. From, well, we went to all the homeless camps and passed out flyers and, you know, and yeah, man, people came. The great part of that was they were having, and we also were doing a project for um, another ecology show that they were doing. And they had the opening at the same time when we did the performance, 
And we got all these free passes and let out all the homeless people in the museum. And uh, yeah, we're not getting invited back there either. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, they got to go in, free drinks. They got, not only did they get free beer and cigarettes from us, they got in and got free liquor and champagne. And uh, all of a sudden, they, you know, I don't know who figured out, but someone figured out what we were doing. And uh, someone, they, I don't know how they had this stamp, but this kind of intern comes running out and, and takes all our entrance tickets and stamps counterfeit on all of them. <laughs> so, yeah, they, they, they stopped that flow of people pretty quick. So I, you know, I don't know if it was like, well, we'll have the in-store opening for our patrons and the, and the outdoor opening for the, I don't know. I really don't know what they were thinking. I, but yeah, there's, there's that kind of weird stuff that can happen. Oh, we're done? You know, there's one more question? Well, thank you. You can ask me after it's over. Thank you all.